what's happening just uh playing a little guitar waiting for joe he's going to be right up so we'll just wait everybody to gather along here i've been working on two things on guitar and i'm not a guitar player i'm a bass player but first was uh love me two times by the doors so it goes so, yeah. Oh, oh, we got Joe. Hey, oh, you're, just play, play a little guitar here. <laughs> you're ready live. We're just, you know, I'm on time. I'm punctual, my friend. My God. What is that like? What is it's that? amazing, you know. It, your life is so much better. I was just playing, showing the folks. You could, you want me to drop you out? You're just, you just go ahead and get set up. I'll, I'll entertain the folks with some guitar. I so was it, flying I was, in here. I need you to send me a link because I need to put it up on locals where I am and stuff like that. Uh, did you put it in X? Because I do need to share yeah. that out. That's an important part of. I, I'm definitely there. Okay, I'll just do the invite link. Um, no, not the invite link. The regular stream link wherever we're streaming, so I can share on X uh, on my locals. I need to share on X and locals. Okay, so. can, you can join stream, right? I'm in stream with you. What do you mean join stream? Like you, you click your little button up there that says stream to you also? Oh, I'm not doing that. First of all, I don't even see that button here, but I wouldn't do that anyway. No, I don't no. I, I think that, that would that would deprive you of of views. No, come on. And besides I, I don't I don't make any money on views. You could I, I you know, maybe some of your guys will want to buy my sexy books. Mm. Um I, I put it in private chat. Here's the other one I was working on. Are, are you saying you'd prefer me to, to do that? Because if you prefer me to do it, I can try to figure out how to do that. Yeah, I'd prefer it. Just there's a button up there that says stream live. and like a No, my live. button. I don't have that button. You don't have that button? I'm looking for it, and I don't see it. Here's us checking out. The, this Rick Beata did this, and I've always loved this. I've, se I've seen it when I was on with Eric Hundley. I haven't seen it. I don't see it here now, though. Huh. Maybe it's in, if I go to comments, probably see. I don't think. No, I don't, I don't know. see it. Check this out. Like... <laughs> That was really good. Because can you play? Can you play "Live and Let Die" also? That's it. That's it. That's it. Anyway, I'm just playing my guitar here. There is there is no more alluring thing that a skill a man can learn than to how to play guitar. Really? You think it's so? like I think it's the easiest. I think it's got such a great, it's got such a, a phenomenal um allure to effort ratio. You can <laughs> see that that it's like almost unparalleled it's almost it's unparalleled when you think about when you think about it i mean i mean say you know i'm a sexy guy and one of the topics is rock and roll so yeah, there you, you know, go you there see you go. so it's all in the theme you see and i have my drink of choice nice. um, which for tonight's stream mm -hmm. listen to that we're going with a little wine although i don't know if this counts and we're gonna have to discuss this because this is actually port i'm not a big red wine guy but port look at this this is beautiful here i'll show you it's a uh, taylor fladgate sweet 10 year old also, port hold on one you second i'm getting paged i'm getting paged by go the... ahead you go ahead we're part of the family here thank you thank you all right i'll be right back sure well let's introduce everybody while joe's taking a break here let's see we got um dave good to see you shane of course my lovely mod here Catherine k and uh oh that's nice thank you catherine yeah i know and i love streaming with joe i'm sure we're gonna have a great show tonight and you guys are in the right place because every time i'm with joe i i just feel like i just feel joy because he's a fun guy to stream with all right and sadie how are you uh yellow orange red oh you're just all over the place right man things are rocking bell of the body you my rumble person of course nailing down it's like it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a Gosney stream without Bella the Bayou over in Rumble, right? Zach, the guitar, right? I'm just playing a little, I'm a bass player, but I'm trying to, 
I play kind of percussively, you know, as you can see. Lee Lee, happy Thursday, and Just Dawn. Good to see you. And uh and hello, Haynes One Pack. I, I don't in Rumble. Welcome. White Rabbit. White Rabbit, did you read my book yet? <laughs> Am I gonna write it faster than you can read it? Uh, you're in it, you know, a couple times actually in the dedication and within the body text. Tia, Trish, look at this, all my favorite people. Slidey Pie, Eric, what's kicking? Um, thank you, thank you. Uh, let's see. Let's take a deep breath. Let's all take deep breath. We need to fast group. Take deep breaths all together, okay? It's good for you. Actually, you know, Tony Franklin taught me this, and he's a good guy, you know, and he taught me how to breathe. That sounds odd, but when you feel a little panicked, like I am right now, because Joe's not here and I'm all solo, and you know, without me, without a foil, <laughs> breathe 10 seconds in. Let's say, ready? Or let's do eight seconds. <laughs> eight seconds. Hold eight seconds. And then out eight seconds. There, that's good. Yeah, so um, diamonds and henna. And uh, well, thank you. I don't know. I'm more of a bass guy, but I'm trying. I've got my own style on the guitar. It's kind of a dot bass thing. And um, yes, to the wine. Wine is a good thing. Kevin, Kevin, we got everybody here, man. Everybody's here. AJ, yes, we're going to catch you. Okay, good to see you. We're going to catch you. Um, we're going to do a little meet and greet, a private, an individualized meet and greet for AJ and her husband, of course. Proxy lady. We got to do some guitar for Proxy lady, right? I've just been playing. I love this guitar. And it makes me want to play it better because <laughs> I can't. It's like. <laughs> Like something like that. Right? Rock and roll. We can rock while Joe's not here. He might put the clamp down. He might disagree with my rock and roll. Uh, let's see. Uh, Jay Leakbot's here? Well, I didn't see him. Uh, okay, see Rebel. Uh, let's see here. Boy, you guys are rocking it. Le Le Nick Levy, 86. Thank you for that. Um, you know, we'll see. <laughs> I mean, I'm my own little thing. I got to say that since I've been a little more public in this YouTube and this stuff, um, I am just amazing how div how screwed up our world is. I just came out of the came out of my little happy world and tried to enter into this fray. And boy, the world is screwed up. Kevin, you're a guitar guy. That is a um, a Martin D41. Martin D41. Um, she said, I can't read the book till she's finished reading it. Okay, well, you know, you guys got to read. I want to hear, I want a full book report from you guys because you guys are inspirational. You heard a lot of it. Now that you see the whole thing in context, I'd like your ideas. Um, let's see. Yeah, no, I'm not nervous, really. I don't get nervous. Uh, expert, good to see you. Boy, where's it? We got all the people are here, man. Ski, uh, special forces agree, really? Okay, well, that's box breathing. Hmm. I was teaching people how to breathe. Sorry about that. Okay, get a first acoustic budget. You know, try a Washburn. Washburn guitars are good quality American <coughs> guitars. You can get them for decent amounts, you know. Um, don't go too because what the big mistake here's some little advice right up on the front end if you're going to get an instrument for your child right get something decent and playable not fancy but that's playable stays in tune sounds good plays comfortably don't go for the cheapest model because here's what happens so many times what will happen is parents will come in and they're like well i don't know if the kid really wants to play so i'm going to go to walmart and buy this $40 Chinese piece of junk that you can eat. It's not even worth using it as an ore. 
right? And then the kid picks it up and it's like, this thing doesn't sound or hurts my hands. It sounds terrible. It doesn't stay in tune. And then they don't play it. And then the parent says, oh, well, see, I'm glad I didn't spend any money because the kid doesn't play the instrument, <laughs> right? Yep. Which is Self like, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, spend $300, okay? You know, $300, you get something quality that stays in tune if you're looking for a guitar. So don't get a junk guitar. Now, I got to say, don't you don't have to get super high end either. But um, actually, my son, when he first started playing bass, I bought him a Fender Squire jazz bass for like $250. And he blew past that thing in the first... I'd say three months, maybe two months. After about two months, he'd outgrown it. And I had to buy him a new, I basically bought him an American made. Once I, you know, once he could play, he was way outpacing that instrument, but it stayed in tune. It looked good. It was playable. But boy, compared to the American Fender, then I got a Fender Jazz uh, fretless and I, I stole it. I basically got it for a dirt cheap because nobody can play fretless. So, so anyway, my first thing, get it, get a decent guitar. That's not, you know, a lot of people get electric guitars and like that Paul Reed Smith um, Custom 24. But a lot of people get, they want like, I want a whammy bar and I want lots of pickups and switches. Get the most basic, no whammy bar, one pickup, simple guitar that is, that plays good, sounds good. And, you know, you can, you can finger it and it, it stays in tune stick with that silver tone yeah that's a good one that's a good example um wow yeah silver tone man those are still good guitars i actually fiery red is not showing fiery red you know i don't know if you know fiery red but he has a uh he has cancer bad like terminal so let's really? all pray let's I'm all pray for that. fiery red yeah Indeed. he's one of our common chatters here and i'm gonna tell you he that, that person you pulled up there, Shenny Graham Yellrock, was one of the first yeah. people to follow me on X. Like I think even before I was long before I was streaming, Shenny Graham Yell, Yell Rock. Okay, a bit of an artist, like a um and like a different type of art. Like she'll like highlight a feature and and it's like sort of like almost like I don't know, I don't know the right the right terminology for it, but uh, yeah, I've I've for like three years now I think she's been following me, which is way longer than any long before Nick. Moment for Nick Domin. So oh, like, you're, you're getting some agreement from Arkansas. The true about the guitar, it's sexy. Do you play mm. an instrument? No, nah. I mean not 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 a musical instrument. So I'm not. No. All right. Well, um, and and I want to say first of all, congratulations on all of your beautiful family success. Thank you. And, Thank you. And shalom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's so yeah. so wonderful for you and. I Thank mean, you. this is the last child that's kind of left the nest. Is that true? The last one for a while. Meaning, for one meaning, so, meaning, meaning that um, in, in my circles, so boys start looking for like a, a wife when they turn like, I don't know, somewhere between 22, 23 in that age range. And um, for, for girls, it'll be as young as 18, 19. And so I have three kids that are married now. Um, two of them. So I have a son who's 24. They don't tend to find a wife right away. They usually take them like till you know a year or two. But um, so yeah, my my next closest one is a 19 year old son. So I'm looking like I have three four years before I have to start thinking about him getting married. But I had these two who were here who just got married the last six months was my now 25 year old son and two year old daughter. And like your the, two year old daughter, that's 22, young, isn't it? 20, 22 oh. years. She just, she's the one who just got married. She was turning 23 in, in a week or so. So, and that was considered by our standards to be getting long in the tooth. Like, that's like, <laughs> yeah. I know it sounds well, crazy. Tradi it's no, traditionally, that is, you know, no. women got married between, you know, 16 and 24. That was the kind of yeah. the range traditionally back going back 50 years, 100 years. I now can't. we've pushed that back further and further and further to the point that now we're dealing with all these issues of, of people getting, you know, they're front ending all this stuff. You know, marriage and family is not an impediment to life. It's a it's a benefit to life. It's it is something life. that makes your life. Benefit, it, is it is life. Yeah. Right. You know, and so I don't need this like, well, I've got all of these selfish priorities I want to put up front. But, you know, it's so much like going to 
movie by yourself, going to a movie with your somebody you love and fast spouse, a companion, a, um, that's what it's about. Yeah. And so, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Now, what is the Jewish tradition as far as like paying the coin? Do you, do you pay the daughters? What is the, what is the rule there for the wedding? So, so basically traditionally it's, it's when you say the coin, you mean the cost of the wedding, or you mean like the whole like dowry type of perspective on these things? Which one? Which well, are you asking? No, I mean, what is the tradition when it comes to that? Uh, does my mic is everybody saying my mic's cutting in and out? Is it? Can it, you is, hear it is cutting in and out. Yeah. I don't so know what that a, is. It's not a streamyard thing. It's it's a. It sounds like it's a mic thing. Like there's a loose. Yeah, wire. I don't know. We're just gonna have to live with it. How bad is it? It's not terrible. It's not terrible. Every once in a while, it's like every like three minutes or so. A word you say will sort of just glitch out. Otherwise, oh, that that works too. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes no, I'll, I'll default. Let me see. Hold on. Echo cancellation. It really sounds like it's a loose wire somewhere. Okay. Um. So, so what is the uh, rule here? So you're so you're asking me about who's who's paying for the marriage? You asking like in the sense of this reception and those costs? Are you asking me about like? traditionally like the whole dowry type of thing that we always i'm just like looking for the secret jewish goal oh <laughs> and i get in on that somehow <laughs> there's there's um an investment that is made by the father into the into the into the son like a traditional dowry type of thing he accepts certain financial burdens on himself as far as taking care of the wife there's actually and then there's a marriage contract which we which we sign in the um marriage contract the husband commits to take care of the of maintaining the wife in the sense of providing her with food clothing <laughs> and satisfaction like like satisfaction with the way the way Mick Jagger meant it when he sang about it. He, you mean you mean it. like like the first word in our title here yes yeah, uh, well, that's just, but you know this is, so this is traditional. That's a commitment that that's a commitment that husband t is taking upon himself to keep her sure. satisfied and, and provide her with food and and clothing. Now, but when he gets is that unreasonable, I mean, of of a loved one and a family, is it unreasonable to have certain family expectations of each other? I mean, that's what marriage is. That's what life is, right? Isn't that? I, I don't know. Yeah. Why would you enter and not have that as part of it? Isn't that part of the deal we're making? It's my the point is that, that that is what that is what he commits to, and also that if he divorces her, that he has to pay certain monies to her. If he leaves her, he has to pay certain monies to her. Diane, so, listen to this. Oh, go on, sorry. The Diane just yeah, got go ahead. she's emailed me the triplets. They were born yesterday. Three boys and two boys and a girl. Triplets. See congratulations. And, that's awesome. Now, are you a grandparent yet? Three times. Three grandsons I have. My oldest daughter got married five years ago. Um, uh, not five years ago. Yeah, it's gonna be five years this summer. And God bless her. She has three sons. All of them are the oldest is three. So she's got a three year old, a two year old, and a one year old. And um, yeah, she's. Uh, Do they live near you? And uh, like an hour away. Okay, that's like good. An hour away. So how often yeah. do you get to see them? They're coming tomorrow. They come, I'd say, probably every couple of weeks or so. Mm -hmm. So they come in. They're a handful. They're a handful. Let me tell you, kids that size, they're... I can't let them in my room because that's where I have all my streaming stuff. And you got the, the flashing lights of the computer. And they'll just be the literally just ripping at, at everything. What's this so, wire do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's essentially, yeah. It's like, it's like, oh, flashing light. Let me smash through the glass and touch it. And it's like no, no. So I always have to remember to turn. I usually leave things on like all the time, like I and I'll just like restart them every once in a while because the computer needs to be like refreshed. But like and I'll leave it on through Shabbos and stuff like that. And with them around, I'm like no, I gotta shut everything down because they're just gonna. It's just too alluring to them. I don't blame them. I don't blame them. You're a three year old. That's what you're gonna be drawn to. So, yeah. well, um, you know, I I came up with this topic because. I was thinking, you know, I, I just wrote my latest novel. I don't know if you've heard about this. Did you hear about You? My, yes. An author? You? Really? It's hard to believe, but I will show you. It is now available. And then since you're, since all of your folks have now funneled into the stream, we can now grift, right? Beautiful. Uh, Do it. So, so I will grift away. So here's here's the uh, the old Gosney website. If you go to shop, 
See, you go shop, there's death penalty desires now available. So we have the PG rated soft cover, and then we have the R rated ebook. Now I Whoa. will say the R rated version is the full version. The, I've I've edited it because see it's death penalty desired passion and murder versus death penalty desires passion lust and murder. So I took ah. out the lust, you see. Ah, all right. And uh, and this one, the PG rated version, I'm going to use it as a companion teaching tool with death penalty debates and my upcoming book, Death Penalty Designs as a trilogy on learning the death penalty for appellate lawyers. So this will be a training book. And I so then I don't have to be embarrassed by sending around lusty books to my office mates. Um, <laughs> but if you want the full lust, you can get it only, the R-rated version is only on my website. Now, Death Penalty Desired is on Amazon now for download. So you can download that on ebook um, right now. I'm, I'm pre-ordering the soft covers here. so. So that's what's going on. And thus that that writing that book and creating these two versions, I was like, why why shouldn't I create two versions, right? No. I mean, it's my book. I can do what I want. <laughs> so yeah. and and then but I was saying, well, you know, there's this dilemma because a lot of people say, Well, you're a Christian. How can you write sex stuff? You're a Christian. Like Christians don't have sex. <laughs> what is that? You know, there's there's this idea that's projected on the pious that religious people are somehow anti-sex yeah. and and that is a falsity i think that i mean in fact i think that it's actually worse than that i mean i think they portray as if we as if religious people give off that or try to give off that that type of appearance while in, in behind closed doors they're engaging in the most illicit corrupt type of terrible sex imaginable that's why you know i mean the catholic church has been like is notoriously pounded Less so, I think, over the last couple of years, but certainly in the early part of the 2000s into through, into like 2015 or so, it was you couldn't go like six months. It felt like without hearing some scandal that was purportedly happening in the church, and, it's and part of that is the problem. There was a certain relishment and glee that those stories were always told the, over. Exactly, they're caught, yeah. they're exposed. Aha! You see, they're all a bunch of fakers. It's like the tunneling Jews. You know, they love to see the, the people pious fall. They want to criticize the hypocrisy. I mean, a lot of that's overreported because the um, the Catholic Church's, you know, problems regarding um, sex and stuff with the... Actually, the public school system is much worse. Teachers are about 10 times more likely, about eight times more likely to have those type of problems. But yet... You don't near. You don't think. Oh, immediately when you say, "Oh, you're a, a school teacher." Oh, well, you must be one of these people, right? But yeah. but the media has so Poisoned. slandered the church yeah. that now that's what people think. Oh, well, I don't like those priests, right? Yeah, I mean, pri I, yeah priest means someone who's going to be like touching children is basically how they try to make it you feel. That is, and it's, and it's 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 an unfair it's an unfair characterization, which is certainly intentional because it's designed to help assuage their guilt about the fact that they have absolutely no no religion. In in their lives so if they can basically pretend that religion by definition equals hypocrisy that gives them justification for claiming that there's that that their chosen lifestyles are proper because everyone recognizes there's no such thing as being actually religious there's just people who are hypocrites who pretend that they're religious so that's that's why these stories get promoted that's why that's why they get greedily swallowed up and spat back out because it's designed to make people feel better that's a lot of what we see in our culture in general it's basically i'm going to become popular if i can make you feel better about yourself we see, and and this plays out in a myriad of different ways uh there was a clip that i saw recently which where christopher hitchens was was talking about someone how back in when he was you know a big name he's obviously he's past now but that it was a very popular thing um everyone everyone would make jokes about how dumb george bush is like that was the ongoing thing he said it's the lowest form of humor out, out there and then when they started doing the same thing with trump like as soon as you say trump that gets a laugh as soon as you say bush is stupid that gets a laugh where it's basically trying to feed the masses and some notion that you're actually very superior to all these people who are who have public attention and to try and and bring them down and that that's a way of, of trying to appeal to the masses and make them feel better about themselves even though it's patently false and stupid for anyone to actually believe 
like you, you think most people who watch a news clip or whatever or, or some comedy show are smarter than than george bush i don't think george bush is particularly brilliant but I, i'm sure he's a lot smarter than most of them who are sitting in the right. audience but it's like we can all just say ha ha bush dumb ha ha bush dumb or ha ha orange man you know is you know some is stupid or bankrupt or whatever when you know that he's probably smarter than you probably richer than you and and has likely had many more successes than you but it's like we're all going to sit here and just laugh at that and bring them down because that makes us feel better about ourselves well similarly in the, con in the context that i'm describing this when they're able to bring down religion it's the same it's the same type of vein it's like and it's it's actually even stronger than that because religion is something that that affects them on a day-to-day -day basis so it's like they feel a certain level of guilt that about their lack of religious conviction and that way they feel better about that where it's like i don't have to i should watch i feel guilty everyone knows that these religious people are all full of crap so that's that's why those stories sell really effectively and that's why that's one of the major reasons that the that the church was hammered hammered for for any any scandal that came out anywhere now, some well, of it perhaps is justifiable. I want to be clear. Some of it is justifiable to the extent that, you know, various rabbis would hide scandals or the church hid scandals. You know, that some of it is justifiable. I'm not trying to say that, right, that everyone that, here you know, is a saint. It, well, here's, you know, I was, and this is interesting because you're my Orthodox Jewish friend here. And, uh, you know, obviously we have a New Testament here in the Christian faith. And, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I know there's so many echoes of Orthodox Judaism in the New Testament, obviously, you know, there it's the Jewish tradition. Um, so I wanted to read to you this, and this goes right along with saying from Matthew, which is the book of Matthew, which is one of the Gospels, and it's Matthew um, um, one through four. It's not or, rude if I eat supper while you're doing this, right? No, is, no, please. This so is like my only chance to eat before my show. Go ahead. I'm so happy you're here, and it's always I. I you are one of my favorite people to be talking to, and I'm so honored that you me give too. your time to me. It's really a blessing. It's my pleasure. It's my privilege. Thank you. Um, Matthew 1, to, he says, Stop judging that you shall not be, you may not be judged. For as you judge, you will also be judged. And the me measure with which you measure will be measured out to you. Why do you notice the splinter in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the wooden beam in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me remove that splinter from your eye, while the wooden beam is in your eye, you hypocrite, remove the wooden beam from your eye first, then you will see clearly to remove the splinter from your brother's eye. Interesting. Yeah, which is, you know, people talk about that, about the, you know, the splinter in the eye, which, which is so that's what the thing is when before you've got a lumber log in your eye, right? <laughs> like, hey, you yeah, know, that's you, what was really so me, the choice of wooden beam rather than like, you know, shard, you know. Wooden beam is really big. <laughs> That's really big. Like if I was authoring that, I don't know that I would have authored it that way. I would have probably put shard <laughs> to imply something bigger. But wooden beam is almost like a whole different thing altogether almost. Yeah, well, but, but I, is there... Um... Is that strictly, is that a Christian, I mean, that's obviously in Matthew, so it's a Christian, part of the Christian Bible, but are there analogs in that in um, in Judaism in the, that you would um, point me to? Interesting question. I'm trying to think. You basically, I mean, it's basically decrying hypocrisy, right? Or mm -hmm. or failure to... Well, judging others. Judging others, yeah. By that... standard, like, you know, oh, people gossip and bring down, oh, you, like, and that's kind of goes with the church. Well, look at that church, isn't that church, isn't that terrible what those Catholics do or what, what those Jews are doing, you know? Oh, right. you know and and everybody right. loves, they get off on judging others. And right. meanwhile, their own life is a mess. Right. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this. So there's... Uh, um. There's an overarching, in Judaism, there's an overarching theme of judging others favorably. That's a very, very important thematic thing that we have, that you're supposed to give the benefit of the doubt in any way humanly possible to, to anyone else. And with respect to gossip, there's actually like a, a quarter of the atonements that we basically ask for forgiveness for on Yom Kippur, the, holy, the holiest day when we're seeking forgiveness from God, roughly 25% of them relate to things having to do with speech. And the speech ones are primarily about speaking ill of others. So because that's considered such a, it's such an easy transgression for us to naturally walk down that road. It's a, well, isn't there a test? I, I forget who it's attributed to, but that there's like a three-part test of a gossip. It's one, is it negative or is it positive? And if it's negative, is it something that's essential for you? Is it the truth? 
And then is it something that you need to know? So those are kind of a good test to, to hold because it's possible, you know, it's required. Sometimes it's very important to communicate negative information about others. Mm -hmm. But is it true? Is it negative? Is it true? And is it required that you hear it? Those are good. That's a good test. And we all fail. I mean, look, that's we all fail. There's no doubt. But yet, um, I'm going to tell you something. You, you know, I know you're always curious about Jewish respect on these sort of things. Yeah. Most Jewish law, the I mean, the vast majority of, of Jewish law is basically um, you got Mishnah, which was you talk about timing of when these things came out as far as in written works. So written works basically date back 1800 years. Um, even the the, um, the the Talmud came out 1500 years ago. The the written works that govern how we handle stuff, mo most of our stuff comes from what we call Shulchan Aruch, which means a set table, which lays out m much, almost almost everything as far as like Jewish life and Jewish law, which was written 500 years ago. So most of it is is pretty archaic. Most of it long predates, you know, American Western society taking any sort of root in here in America. That's how that's how far back it goes. But the one area which actually was only a hundred years ago. There was a great sage who's got who's nicknamed the, the Chafetz Chaim, which means um, he wants one who wants life. And it comes from Psalm of David, where he says, who is it that seeks life um, and wants to see good all his days? And the next passage is guard your tongue from speaking ill of others. But that leads to, to longer and more happier, and more, more fulfilling life. Um, and it's from, and from speaking trickery, uh, and turn away from evil, and 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 do and 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 chase after good things. So he says that's what leads to to long life. So the phrase for who's searching out life is Chafetz Chaim. So the author of this of this work, Rabbi Yisrael Meir Kagan, who lived like a century ago, he ended up. So he wrote the definitive work for the laws of gossip. And specifically spend a great deal of time about talking about the exclusions. Like when are there exceptions? Like if someone is, if you're looking to go into business with someone, you want to know, is he trustworthy? So you sort of need to know how is, you know, is this person have a reputation for being honest or dishonest? And you don't really know the person really well. What are you supposed to do there? And the person now, if there's a prohibition about speaking ill of others, well, then you go and ask someone advice. So, and he, if the guy's a big crook. What, what, what are you supposed to, how right. is anyone supposed to tell you without violating so there are all sorts, and he well, basically brings down a lot of what you were just describing there. Is it um, true? Is it negative? And is it something you need to know? In that case, it's all of those things, right? Right. That's that, that, that's that's the point is that there are certain circumstances. But even then, I'll tell you something interesting. The person that you're talking to, you're getting information for, like cannot be in the same industry as the one you're asking about. Because there's an <laughs> assumption, there's an assumption that even if he's not trying, even if he's trying to be, you know, he's the most religious person on earth and he's very sincere and he's trying not to gossip that there's a little bit that will inherently come out in his tone. I mean, and by the way, gossiping is not simply the words you choose, but in how you say it and how you present it. And that's why in order to do something like this, you have to have great wisdom as if you're going to actually do it without 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 really wronging some a, a, another person. And and that's why, like, for example, I'm, if someone asks me about another lawyer, like and stuff, I, I I sh it would be wrong for me to like sort of bash that guy because it's sort of if it's someone who's a lawyer in my industry, because there's an assumption that I can't that if you are someone who's affected by it, you you cannot possibly give an honest answer. Yeah, and I've I've grown a lot. You know, I'm, I'm guilty of that. When I was younger, I I kind of say I was much too hard on other lawyers, I would say. Um, here I have some some interesting little chats, and this is going to segue us a little bit. And so let's go through these these ones I starred here. Um, first of all, horse clap, Spemberson. Thank you for being a nice. member. That's nice, and I, I need the membership, so that's wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. The second one is um, so upon the horizon says, and this this these two comments go together. And I want to question, ask a question. For thirty years, I've been saying the Christian Church has been silent on God's intentions for sexuality. And the secular world has been all too happy to promote perversions in its place. Hmm. Very good comment. Now, the next question is, or next comment is, okay, but that does not say don't judge at all. Just know what we are all to submit equally to God's righteous judgment. The Bible says, if you love me, God, keep my commandments. 
So what I'm, what these two are kind of echoing is sort of the, the flip side. So we're talking about don't judge, but that Christian precept has been weaponized against the faithful and against religious and traditional societies to say, well, who are you to judge? I can then for do whatever I want, unlimited freedom. So so this is a um a very it's 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 a balance here. It's not it's not so easy, is it? Because there is a requirement, I think, for us to tell our children and our families and our friends the difference between right and wrong and how to have a happy life through following a a certain path. So well, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I, my, my response back to that is this. When I was watching McAfee during closing arguments and the whole Fannie Willis evidentiary hearing, okay? So this whole hearing that was going on there, McAfee was asking questions to counsel while they're in the middle of giving their closing arguments. And what I was saying, trying to explain to my audience is that frequently when you see a judge do this, and, it's the, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because it's not just a judge. It's really in any day-to-day -day conversation. You don't just listen to the words of the question, but you have to sort of assess the objective of the person who's asking the question and why is it that they're asking this question. So if they say, if someone comes back and says, who are you to judge? And you have to ask yourself, you know, you have to sort of understand the position that they're standing in that's motivating them to ask the question to figure out whether, is that a rhetorical question? Is that a sincere question? Like you really want to know who am I to judge? Or is it is it a chastisement for someone who's trying to promote a godly perspective? Or is it someone who's trying to promote the antithesis of a godly perspective? And you can ask this, you can use the exact same words, and depending on how you phrase it and where you interject it, you can it's not difficult often to assess the motivation of the asker and recognize that this is not someone who's trying to promote a healthier. A, whole, a healthier perspective of the world. This is someone who's trying to reject that and specifically attempting to twist it on their head. And they don't mean it sincerely because if you threw the question back at them in any other given moment, they would they wouldn't have any answer to it. That's how you can sort of tell. Is so like when someone says like you know who are you to judge and then they go back to basically you know working as a prostitute. It's like you're not trying to protect yourself like under you're not trying you you that's a perversion. When I say perversion, I mean the classical use of the term. Oh, twisting. It's a twisting intentionally trying to just shut you up rather than actually searching for truth or justice or things that are fair. And it and to just blind ourselves to the nature of the person who's asking the question is basically to just completely misunderstand scripture and the objectives behind what you're what you're seeing in scripture. And and I think it's I think we we allow the power of the words of scripture when they are being twisted to just be like, oh yeah, that's true. I can't say it because that's words in scripture, even though clearly scripture doesn't mean it the way that it's being twisted in that particular moment. And I think that and I, I think that we allow people to get away with that as a way of trying to refute they'll use scripture to refute scripture. That's right. that's that doesn't even make any sense. That, that's, 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 well, it's except like, that they're trying to they're trying to disrupt the um the foundation of of your faith and uh, you know when when you're in a discussion with somebody I, you know i think you have a good point and i've used this i used to do radio show i used to be on the radio uh, with a fellow named mark bernier he did a local radio show here and mm -hmm. i'd go on like on fridays you know once a month or once every couple of weeks and we'd talk sorry my you need to get that. <laughs> no it's the, the wife okay there we go see um the and and one uh, you know these callers would call in and they'd they'd want to get my goat and they'd want to say well you know what do you think about this you're this Republican guy you're this guy you know I wasn't actually that religious at the time um, and I so I started laying down some rules and one of the rules was that in order to have a productive conversation with somebody we have to have a mutual interest in speaking the truth together mm -hmm. we have to believe there's an objective truth. And we have to be striving for it together because a conversation like this, I mean, obviously we're going to disagree on some fundamental things, but mm -hmm. we're going to agree on some things. And one of the things we can agree on is that there is a truth. We There is a fundamental truth. We're both seeking it. And we're doing that in a open, good hearted way for the benefit of both of us. And, and I, and I think that that is a sort of a foundation. And also there's no ad hominem attacks, but that's not, I mean, right. so 
you know, and th that because that's what what you're saying is the technique that you're talking about is when people come at you, they really aren't seeking the truth. They're of course just, not. They're, they're trying just, to tear they're looking to shield themselves. They're looking to shield themselves from from the scrutinization of 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 the attack, uh, an attack that's being legitimately leveled at them. So that's so that that's that's the mo I'm sorry, I cut you off, but that's that, that, mm -hmm. there's, there's no attempt to search for the truth. And the way you know it is because if you brought to them a different passage, which would basically tell them that everything that they were doing five minutes ago was completely awful and terrible, would they change their and you say if I if I show you something here which shows you how twisted this is, would you change your behavior at all? If not, then you can't go to scripture and try to say that this is that this is a basis to shut me up. That doesn't well, make any sense. They have to have you have to have a they have to have a stake in the conversation. Precisely. Now, if they're and that's the stake that they would change their behavior. They're changing well, their if, if they're seeking to, their to, to tack and tear down whatever you've constructed and what you're putting out there and you're staking your position, that can be a decent conversation, but the conversation then becomes you have to be able to fully flesh it out. It, it challenges you and it makes you think and makes you question you. But you have to, but and others can benefit by that interaction, but it's really not a conversation. It's more of an exploration on the person who's being questioned and on what they are thinking have they fully thought through how do they what do they believe it's the, it's not the person who's doing the attacking isn't really engaged in a conversation that's simply a a debate that's going on or maybe a even an attack it's a tactic it's a tactic a tactic and in so much we've we've polarized the world so much now that that's what we want to do is i want to put you in a box call you a name I understand everything about you. You're the enemy or you're on my side. Which team are you on? And then the whole world, you know, the ideology frames the world for you. And I don't I want to win. To I want to win rather than finding truth. I want, it's, I care more about winning personally than actually finding truth. That's but truth is so it. much more important than any selfish individual quest. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that it's, it's not worthy of that type of thing. We really need to value our conversations more than that. Indeed. Um, now, let's focus back on our sex topic, because I do uh, want to at least give the people what the, we promised them. We did promise. And so regarding sex, now, obviously, the Catholic Church has a lot of rules on sex, and Catholics are known for breaking those rules <laughs> kind of, as, a, as a group. And uh, I can say that I wasn't Catholic for a while. So let's when say, you say that I may you say as a group, you mean as individuals. Right. Well, not, yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we speak it, but don't necessarily practice it, right? You know, the mm -hmm. whole however, but that's just humanity. I mean, we we break all kinds of rules for God's rules, and we but but yet those rules do exist. That doesn't mean those rules are incorrect, it just means that the flesh is weak. Um, so, but let's talk about the rules because the rules are a judge. And Jordan Peterson talks about this a lot about how any rule that you set out is necessarily a judge on our own behavior. So it's like, if you say premarital sex is wrong mm -hmm. and I've had premarital sex, now I'm, do, I'm condemning myself by establishing that rule. Okay. So, and so instead of condemning myself, it's much easier to say, well, the rule's wrong. Well, the rule could be correct. I just may have been out of line or maybe I was, I, you know, I let the loins get the better of me or whatever. That doesn't mean the rule is incorrect. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what, what I mean, th th this is, of course, everybody knows the Catholic positions. I imagine that the Orthodox Jewish tradition is even more strict. Um, let me think about this mm -hmm. for a second. How to best frame this? Mm -hmm. How do we talk sex amongst us guys? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, when I was writing this book, there's some dirty parts in it, right? You know, the, the R-rated version. The, there's a lust version, right? And it's a part of us. We are part, we are part, we rise up from the beast. We have a primal nature. We have a, um, but yet that, when harnessed for good, that creates children which is the foundation of everything. So it, can it be, is it wrong? <laughs> is sex wrong when put in the right vessel? Now, when you're this, this crazy amoral sexuality that's been allowed for, especially by the birth control pill and, and, you know, and by um, prophylactics and different things like that, it's allowed people to be a lot 
to, to choose immorality and to choose just to be free. But it's a very personal thing. Sex is a very personal thing. It's a very individual thing and that you share with your spouse. And that is when it's the most holy and it's the most um, fulfilling. 100%. 100%. And, and, and God blesses that union. God blesses 100%. Um, the marital union, right? I mean, and that's mm -hmm. what we all seek. I'll, I'll, I mean, it's. I feel as if you're 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 asking me what what Jewish perspective is on this topic. Well, uh, that's what, I'm, if I'm wrong, I'm, I don't want, I don't want to jump in on something and make and draw assumptions. So I just want to I want to make sure that I'm, I'm that's what if that's correct, I'm okay with answering that. I just don't want to start blabbering on on that. No, no, blabber on. Go ahead. That's you're a guest. Please blabber right. on. So. There's really no reason for anyone to want to have children if you consider the burden that you are bringing upon yourself. There's a paternal drive and a maternal drive. But we've all seen what how difficult it is to raise children. And we look at sex as being designed literally to draw you in for purposes of propagation. God basically gave us a sex drive, made it a pleasurable act, so that we would have motivations to procreate. And that's really the primary reason why it is otherwise. And is there an element to drawing you close to your spouse and feeling that that part of a, a union with your spouse? Perhaps. I think that that's, that's certainly a healthy, that's that's a, a healthy outgrowth of it. But that that's what sex is ultimately for. Sex is for procreation, which is, by the way, there's a reason that all these other forms of alter alternative forms of sex are, I mean, which are prescribed under any basic reading of Torah, New Testament, or whatever. It's because it's it's not pro it's not procreative, right? So if you're engaging, someone's engaging in homosexuality, they're engaging in other awful terrible things that people do it's not it's not procreative towards a healthy towards a healthy child and that's why even incest the same thing as far as genetically the impact of the byproduct of that so that is why <clears throat> so if, if you start from that perspective that that ultimately is what sex is about it's about building a, a, it's about building the next generation so now we look at the fact that when people are engaging in premarital sex, you're not in a position where you are able to help. You're certainly not doing it for the purposes of trying to have children. I mean, it's rare. Sometimes I guess people look about, you know, when someone has fertilization issues and stuff like that. So, but whatever, I mean, as far as new, new things that have come along over the last several decades, as far as alternatives towards finding a way towards for women to conceive, I don't, I don't think that's really relevant to this topic because this is really a topic about sex rather than... than well, I, I'll, I'll be redirect it because... Well, first, we have a Rumble rant. Thank you very much, Rumble rant. I had to copy a paste. <laughs> For some reason, it's, the rants don't show up on StreamYard. The chats mm -hmm. do, but not the rants. Um, and Mild111 says, a wonderful topic. I literally just did an hour plus stream myself on shame and dignity. And find this topic of self-control fasting. It's missing from modern society. Yeah, that's why I like talking about it because I think that we don't have enough of these discussions in our in our society. So that's why I I tend to focus on these things because I don't hear it in our popular culture. And these are some of the most important topics. Agreed. Well, um, you know, and I'm gonna I'm gonna maybe try to expand because you said it's primarily for sex is primarily for procreation. Yes, that's true. But then again, what about I think there's an also it brings you closer to the person that you love. It's a it's a completion of, you know, it's a physical creation between two people that love each other. And it makes a man and a woman closer and uh, in a way that it's kind of almost mystical. And and um, so even let's assume, you know, you're you're both in your older, elder years. There's still something blessed about. A, a marital relationship okay I, I i agree with that definitely what i why though well i mean it's it's almost a 
service, it's almost like a joining together. Because one of the things about being married is it stops being about me and it starts becoming about we. It's us. It's something greater. Like you said, no individual would want children, but we want children because it's it makes we greater. It makes the family greater. It makes the world a more beautiful place. It's the purpose of living. So to me, the... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to play devil's advocate here, though. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so now you're, you're an individual's productive member of society. You're, you're, you're helping society one way or another. Either you're informing them, you're providing some service, you're, or you're, or you're, you know, you're on one level or another, you're, you're, you're uh, aiding society. So why, why would you need to have a relationship with a woman and build children of your own? You're already contributing to society, so I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here. So, what in what sense, what sense is that an, a necessary part of you as a person, or a better necessarily even a betterment of you? Especially, you might be terrible at being a, a parent. So now you tell me. Again, I'm playing devil's advocate here because I don't believe this, I, I, but I'm, I want you to sort of flesh out in your own mind. So, why is that such an an important thing for for an individual to experience necessarily um there's a lot of there's a lot of different joys in life that we never experience some people never experience skiing some people never experience other you know other forms you know of 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 enjoyment why is that a nature of a part of life that is that is you know a must for every for any for any person well, and I, I don't, you know, I, I'm not, I don't have all the answers and this is why, you know, it's good to talk about them because you, you think about things and I, I don't, I can throw out ideas that come to mind. Mm -hmm. I, I'd I like that. I like, I have thoughts. I have, I have a lot of thoughts as far as answers to this, but I don't want, I sort of, it's healthiest. I think if we sort of try fleshing this out in our own mind and then you hear a perspective and you're like, well, I'd okay, like to that. hear your own, your answer to your own question, but um, I haven't thought through that really probably as much as you have, but I'll throw out some ideas and then you. It doesn't mean you're going to be. I'm not, it's not a test. It's not a test. No, well, it's no, we're, like... we're seeking the truth together, right? Right. Right. That's the thing. We're, we're, we're exercising, we're trying to figure out, trying to gr grow closer to God through the exploration of truth. Right. And I, I think that outside of procreation, sex is still important. If you had two people that couldn't have children and they're, you know, they get married, but they still love each other and they, you know, to me, there's a, a sexual need, a sexual uh, function that both parties need. Now, maybe if they don't, neither one is interested, then they don't have to. That's not like you have to force them. But yet, this is the person that you've chosen to be a companion that you will be closer to. It. It's almost the definition of the marital relation. So I think that sex grows beyond just procreation into making you, unifying you with your spouse. Now, if from a strictly psychological position men tend to be a little bit more wall they can wall off sex from relationships but but to women when when women have sex with somebody my understanding is psychologically that really is that there's a pair bonding that goes with that relation mm -hmm. so that's why yeah, that's certainly true uh, yeah i mean i, I think it's it's a there's a different psychological why that is i don't know i think that but i do recognize that that exists that's why it's very important that a woman be very careful with how she spends that coin because if you you need to spend that coin towards the man that you select to be a good father a companion for your life and somebody that you love because if you're just going around it for the for just for fun and just for the experience and for being you're gonna you're gonna pair but you're gonna lose your ability to pair bond with um with men now men have a different worldview and experience but um I'm just, I'm just, these are random thoughts that are shooting out. What's the answer? No, What's the good. answer, uh, Joe? I'm not, I'm, I'm not telling you I have the answer. I'm just going to give you a, a perspective on this. So, um, did I ever talk to you about what heaven, what heaven is? I mean, a lot of people picture angels and harps and whatever it is that their passion is, that, that you have an unlimited supply of that, which is, I, I understand why people do that because it's so hard for us to conceptualize what, what heaven is. But a very close friend of mine who became a head rabbi in yeshiva and I, in Dallas, he actually told me that what heaven is. And he told me this 30 years ago. He's a year or two younger than me. He's a brilliant man. And uh, he told me what heaven is. And what he said is that 
if you look at the relationship between a man and a woman, so why is it that you feel love for your wife? Why does your wife feel love for you? Let's 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 focus on the former. Why is it that you feel love for your wife? Well, you look at you look at this woman. Why you fall in love? So you look at a woman and you say to yourself, "Wow, this woman has so many amazing attributes, so many different talents and abilities, and beauty, and a pure heart, and and brilliance, and just and you look at the qualities of that individual and you feel drawn." to that individual you feel a certain sense of of admiration and attraction that form together that just draw you into that individual and at certain levels it's going to be obviously physical as well but the point is that these are the different things that you see in these different attributes to a woman and that that makes you feel drawn that you want to be closer to that woman that's one element to why people fall in love. And the second element is, there's a, an interesting thing as to how we're hardwired, which is that when you see someone you, you admire and respect displaying love to you, that makes you feel closer to that person. Where you just sort of feel this appreciation, which just makes you have a, a strong desire to reciprocate in kind. I'm not talking about, obviously it depends on the nature of relationship. I'm not talking about if they're acting like some stalker out of the gate and just, you know, or they're they're needy in the way they're looking for your attention. But I'm saying when you're in a healthy relationship with someone, that when they, they end up taking care of doing things, take care or, or, or display their love for you in concerns for like an in, in interest in things that are of interest to you or in trying to meet your needs, that makes you feel a deeper love for them. And what he said is that we believe that heaven is God revealing himself to us. Right now in this world when we're alive, that God, that God is very, very hidden. So much so that people try to deny his existence. And that when we die and go to heaven that we're able to better experience God. And in so being, we would appreciate whatever level of beauty, insight, warm heart, or, or, or compassion that would draw you to a woman is a joke compared to God. So if you see that, and it's actually revealed to you that you feel that level of love for God, and similarly, when you see all the compassion, whatever level of kindness someone does for you is a joke compared to how much God does for us every second of the day, whether it's meiosis of our own cells or digestion or taking care of our environment around us, whether the environment is, is the, the, the physical um, ecosystem that we're in or the society that we're in and the people who are around us and the different steps that it takes to make sure that, that we're properly taken care of, and you're able to actually appreciate that and understand that, you would sit there in awe and feeling this overwhelming love for God. And that's what ultimately, and that's something that you can understand how on an eternal, on an eternal basis, that when you say literally eternity, not just five years, 500 years, 5,000 years, 50,000 years, but eternity, you could understand how, okay, when that is something that, you can appreciate for literally eternity. Now, that so what the reason that it would make sense for God to create relationships from a man to a woman or woman to a man is because a healthy, loving relationship where you're building a home, building together with, with your spouse is a tiny, tiny, tiny microcosm of what heaven is. Actually, and, and this is in, I talk about this in my prepare book because um, reflecting on heaven, and I will say right off the bat that I'm not qualified. I have no concept. It's speculation. And, um, but in, in prepare, I, I develop a concept, which is one of my few real original ideas. Occasionally I have one. <laughs> and, um, and in the discussion, uh, in, there's a discussion in there about how we are separated from 
absolute good and absolute evil by many levels of, by many, many levels, at least seven or eight, okay, and probably a lot more, because we're limited in time and space, in perception, in embodiment. There's so many ways that we're limited, and for us to think that we can comprehend God or heaven is is an arrogance. So I think we need to approach things with humility. True. Um and, and this is a trap, another trap that's laid by the secularists is they say, well, you, my Orthodox Jew friend, or you, my Orthodox Christian friend, can't, you can't state a moral absolute. I will be able to create exceptions. Therefore, there is no moral absolute. And, uh, but that is, and, and we get trapped by that argument. Our, our world, our country, our society has been trapped by that argument and push people away faith. When I, I tried, I think I came up with an answer to that in prepare. And that is, is that absolute truth and absolute falsity or absolute good and absolute evil exist, but it's we can't touch it as humans because of our limitations. It's it's too far away. We're too many levels separated. And um, so why I'm and if people have read prepare, they they'll kind of I walk through the whole thing. But I, I think though that if I was to think what is heaven, it would be a breaking down of those barriers between the absolute good and the individual. So if we are faithful and we follow God, that heaven to me would be a moving into the perfection that is God and away from the imperfection and the um, of the world. So that would be kind of, that's sort of an idealistic answer. Can I, I want to ask, there's another. What was that? Oh, what? The pizza oh, thank you so much. It was delicious. Yeah, so we ha we can't really comprehend God, and this this idea of the transactional relationship. There is a bit of a transaction in in a marriage relationship, uh, you know. And a lot of these, the I've been actually when I was writing Death Penalty Desires, and also I have a son, so I'm I'm so I was studying this the current disaster that is the male female relationship and dating scene that my son and your children will are dealing with. And thank God for your traditional values, and and we really need to get back to that. But but doing the research, there's so much misery and so much happiness on both sides, on the on the male and the female side. And but there are some universal truths about the male sex drive and the female female hypergamy, um, male desire for youth and fertility, and those those are kind of the drive primal factors, right? But yet once you make the commitment on a foundation of God and truth, all of those things kind of fall away. Yeah. It, you know, it doesn't matter then. It's like, you know, those things are of primacy when you're dating and mate selecting. But once you've made the selection, that stuff doesn't matter that much. Okay, so, yeah. you know, like a pretty girl walks in my office. I'm like, oh, look, pretty girl. I appreciate the beauty. That's right. great, you know. But it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't mean anything to me because I'm not interested. You know, I'm not looking. I've, because I've you don't feel that. you don't feel a need to conquer it, because no, you, that, mean, that, that's I essentially that's the it. way it is. You don't need uh, you don't feel a need to draw it in, because no, I could appreciate it. it. I'm glad. I like beauty in the world. I think it's an expression of God. It shows us something transcendent about our world. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter if you're good looking or not, or attractive or not, because that's you know, it's same thing with like the wife. Like my wife is beautiful. But she's also the mother of my kid. We've also been married 25 years. We've built And that's the different together. actions she's done for you. And those are things that you should genuinely appreciate. And, and well, if her. Andrew Branca gets criticized all the time, you know, for, for his, uh, his, his speech. But he said something very wise. And on a, on a tweet once, which I know it's amazing, but I'll, I'll bring it up because it reminds me of this. Somebody posted a picture of sort of a, a middle-aged woman who was, you know, average, good look. You know, average looking, not beautiful or whatever, not like model beautiful, but just an average mm -hmm. woman. And somebody said, you know, it was like, what do you think? Is this woman attractive? And then his answer was, well, who is she to me? Right. Which I think is really because that's the thing. It's like, OK, well, if I'm looking, if I'm wanting to buy a Coca-Cola and want a pet screen ad, then, you know, sure, I'll get Kate Moss or whatever. But who is that to me? She's nobody, right? It's like the, to me, the, the relationship yeah. that you build, the life that you have, the commitment that you make over one lifetime, which is short, mm -hmm. is what's important. Yeah. Yeah. Like, how is it different to you than Cleopatra? You know, who supposedly was a beautiful woman and like, you know, but it's like, you have no relationship with Cleopatra. You have no relationship 
with with any of these you know famous celebrities and and just because one has been dead for thousands of years and the other is alive you're never going to have any it's not any relationship to you so who is she to you and it's 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 a perspective that i think a lot of people easily lose lose sight of but it, you're right it's it's a healthy it's a healthy way of, of looking at it but the point the point i was i was trying to get to is that you can look at your marriage and as much as you love your wife and and have a powerfully strong relationship with your wife i do think that that alone should not be defining you because if we look at it being, as being a microcosm of heaven right and take that take that point to the next step which is the reason that god would basically put us in a situation where we're looking to build these relationships with a spouse so in that case it's ultimately about helping our and furthering our understanding of god and it's not and i think a lot of people who get into really positive relationships some a mistake that they may fall into is sort of looking at that as the end all and be all as opposed to recognizing it for what it is that this relationship as wonderful and amazing as it is is really designed to help you better understand your relationship with god and that is to me that so if, if you look at it from that perspective it, it sort of changes things. And it it's not a reason to diminish your spouse. Uh, quite the contrary. It's a reason to appreciate your spouse while at the same time, appreci the same time appreciating it in a healthy way rather than making it that your spouse is your raison d'etre. Well, the, in fact, in Death Penalty Desires, uh, there's, a, there's an arc of the two main characters. And so it's, it's a love story. There's a romance part of this too. And... I, I, there, I wrote something. It's like the last stuff that I wrote was the most powerful. It's amazing. I, I built this whole framework and then I finished it with this thread that was just inspired. And one of them was that, well, I, I, don't, I don't know if, how she'll, if it's going to spoil it for anybody, but if you, you know, if I say to my wife, I love you, so I love you, my wife, right? That's just a word. And a word is a symbol. And a word it almost diminishes the relationship by the speaking and the expression of the word because you're reducing something transcendent to something that is just a verbal symbol. Mm -hmm. And and so when I say I, I love and I make a commitment to God and I am true, I am showing God my commitment and I am showing God through my actions love by the co lifetime commitment to my spouse. Interesting. Interesting. Well, um, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, there's a couple of, there's one person in here. Oh, here it is. That's, uh, I am not a, I'm not a biblical literalist. So I would recommend uh, Mr. Hasepek, uh read prepare because I am not a fundamentalist literalist of the Bible. I believe it's um, in a different. So th that explains a lot of my faith on that because I think, con you know, Orthodox, when I say conservative or fundamentalist literalists, get into trouble a lot of times, again, by these type of arguments that are being made. I've dealt with those arguments in other streams and we're not going to get diverted. But I do want to shift this because we only have limited time and I could spend all day and all night. This is why you're my friend and I love talking to you because every moment with you is a joy. Thank you. Um, but I do need Thanks. to force and the, the feeling conversation. Is, feeling is quite mutual. Go push us. Force the conversation with? over to drugs. Oh, we got to get to drugs and rock and roll still. We so. got to get to drugs and rock and roll. I don't want you to run off before we've covered all of these salacious topics. So I will say the Catholic Church has a very strong view on this, and it's a strong view of wine. And we, if wine is actually an essential part of the faith. I mean, mm -hmm. the wine becomes the host and the blood of Christ through the, trans, that through the, the, uh, the celebration of Mass. And uh, so you'll see... Um, it, it's, it's interesting that an intoxicant is a part of mass. Now, is there a similar analogy in in Judaism? In Judaism, wine has gone back to services, going back to sacrifices in the temple. They all came with libations, which were supposed to be poured off onto the um, <clears throat> supposed to be poured off onto the altar. 
Uh, so, I mean, that, that goes all the way back to the times of Moses as far as wine being a part of, of the ceremon ceremonial part of things. Um, with respect to, and to this day, even though we obviously don't have sacrifices anymore, when, whenever we start, we start Sabbath, one of, the, one of the customs that even mildly religious Jews will tend to observe is that we sanctify Sabbath on by making a blessing on wine and reckon and, and and basically declaring the day and we'll declare the day over a cup of wine and and, and make a blessing to god and and that is the the commencement of sabbath on all our jewish festivals as well we also close out the sabbath by making a blessing on wine and basically you know um recognizing god distinguishing between the holy and the mundane so to so with the termination of Sabbath, so this there's a short prayer we say over a cup of wine, which is part of it, but it's like basically the whole thing takes like you know two minutes or less, and you uh, and that's where we basically are signaling that's where we're ending Sabbath. So yeah, wine is an, is an intimate part, and then and then by the Passover, and then the other time is by the Passover seder, so we're actually obligated to drink four cups of wine. And and that's as we recount the the Jew salvation from Egypt. So, which now, is not really it's not really about the physical bondage. A lot of a lot of yeah, religious well, Jews, and that's the thing: that. you aren't getting to church to get drunk. And excess is the sin. The yeah. sin is, is anything to excess. Oh, and Purim also people people point out people love my Purim streams streams. So yeah, Purim. We, we, on Purim is a Jewish holiday, which is actually coming up a week from this Sunday is going to be the holiday of Purim. So there, there's that's the the one time of year that we're supposed to get drunk. So, but the the background story behind that is so convoluted, is so convoluted that most ortho, most Orthodox Jews don't even know why we why we get drunk on Purim. It's it's <laughs> it's true. It's true. They just know that we're supposed to get drunk, and it's like a famous thing that we're supposed to get. Who drunk. cares? That's right. I don't care why. That's just part I'm, of the tradition. I mean, the story of Purim is basically you have your the hero versus the villain is Mordechai is the hero versus Haman the the villain, and you're supposed to get so drunk that you you can't even tell the difference between blessed should be Mordechai and cursed should be Haman. Like that's that's the level of drunkenness. Have you ever gone to that down. point yourself? Um, to say literally that. Yes, I don't know. I mean, I've 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 gotten really, <laughs> I've gotten really really bombed on Purim. On Purim, I will I I will. That's the one time a year that I will purposefully try to get drunk. I tend not to do it on wine only because that's gonna you know, like that just like hurts my stomach and I'll vomit everywhere if I do it on wine. I'll, I'll use I usually use scotch, um, and yeah, and people know I I tend to. Last couple of years, I've live streamed on Purim after I got drunk, while I was still drunk, and and on, we also wear costume on Purim. <laughs> yes, I, so yeah, it's funny. Well, uh, was it? <laughs> well, now the, the thing is, is that you don't want to abuse your body, and of course, there's there's a statement in Corinthians, which I think that's New Testament also, but in one Corinthian or um, one Corinthians, you know, it talks about the body is a temple, mm -hmm. and and this is one of the the you know the one of actually this is an interesting actually you know I'm trying to come up with these like you know Jewish analogies because when can Jesus I, can I talk to you about that whole body is a temple thing for a moment? Yeah, we, can, let me finish this thought and then yeah, go you, go for it. Go for is it. that um, when Jesus came to the temple? He says, you know, the temple. I will, I will tear down this temple, and in three days I will re rebuild it. Right. And the, the Jewish people, the Jewish, the Orthodox, the rabbis said, oh, he's saying destroy the temple. But he was saying the body of the temple of Christ was destroyed and was rebuilt in the third day through the resurrection. Yeah, that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. Yeah, well, that's why. Bro, so <laughs> what were you going to ask? There? That's, I was actually, like a week or so ago, I was I was actually having this this um, whole thought process. I was laying in bed, and I tend to, I don't know why, I tend to get philosoph very philosophical on Friday nights, and I'll go through this whole thought exercise where my brain just start wandering, and I'll just start realizing concepts that I never really even, 
thought about and when i when i express them i'm like yeah this is obviously true i don't know why i never really thought about this before so if we look at ourselves and who you are as yourself you steve god who are you steve gosling who's the real steve gosling so i and i started expressing this on my show but i didn't really go into the detail that i'm gonna i'm planning i'm like to explore with you so if you if a person loses a hand a finger a hand a knee any part of their you know outside their torso we know that they're still going to continue existing and and living and no one thinks it's a different person it's the same person they just don't have an arm anymore so all of those are not you your your vital organs most of them are replaceable um you know with exception of your brain which we're going to get there soon but you, you, those are basically um not those are not you so then the question becomes, what is you? And people will tend to immediately go to the brain. But before we get there, if we look at, at who you are, because I think that you are a smaller par portion than your, your brain. It's a piece of, of your brain, and I actually would argue soul. But well, I'm going to work my way there. So you have your eyes and your nose and your mouth and your ears, and, and these are all designed to enable you. So there's a you inside of your brain that now has these different capacities to appreciate and understand your environment. Your eyes to see, your nose to smell, your mouth to taste, your ears to hear, your skin to touch. All of these are basically designed so that the you that I'm talking to, the only you I really care about, right? I mean, if it was just a recording of you, if it was a facsimile of you, I it's not you. So that I'm, the you I'm talking to is a little piece inside your brain. And it's not even the part of your brain which is helping regulate your heartbeat or the other parts of you, because no, you don't, we don't really look at that as being that part of you. So if we look at that part of you, it actually has two features to it that we actually, my, my wife argued a third feature, but I, I disagree with her on this, and I'll, I'm, I'm, I'll mention this. But the two features that I can identify make you, you, are your choices that you make and these are the things that we tend to respect about people right if you think about what is it yeah, that okay. we respect you, about you, an individual you nailed you just already stumbled you know violently flailing into my point that i was going to make but so you you just made point one from Gazi. So yeah keep going what's that point two the choice the choices that you make and the other is your creative expression now my wife and that 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 is a different that that's why it separates you from others but i would argue that your creative expression it's not really is not really you that's and my wife argues personality i don't think that that's because people's personalities change and maybe we'll like them less or or or, or if their personalities manifest in different ways maybe we'll like them less or more but i, I still think that this they're the same you and so you could similarly say the same thing about even even their creativity choices. You know, look at any any brilliant artist like a John Lennon. You see, he made different creative choices over the course of his life. So, and I don't think we look at that that that's John Lennon. So now that's why I'm saying ultimately, the you that anyone actually cares about is the part of you which is expressing free choice on the decisions you're going to that you're going to do with your body and what is with your body it's with your hands and your legs those things that are detachable from you so if you look at what a human is ultimately and you can break them down you can break down every human into these different functions there's the you and wrapped around that you is a brain which helps basically keep everything a memory helps keep a, a memory drive the same way your computer has a memory drive right there's and that you, which is making free choices, is basically assisted with a memory drive, which helps you with your experience. It, it's it's facilitated with your eyes, your nose, your mouth, your ears, and your skin in order for you for the you inside of you to perceive things. It's it consists of bodily organs in order to maintain the eight life processes of digestion, from digestion, circulation, synthesis, re excretion reproduction, all these different things, that's the, the torso of the person. And then to actually carry out these acts, you need to actually have arms and legs to be able to do and function anything. So really, all of these different things are manifestations. They're actually, a, they're, they create the ability for the actual you to do anything. And we can actually look at a human as basically being, it's all these choices, which now the rest of his body is basically geared toward enabling that person to to make those choices and to and to 
and to choose his or her path as to how they're going to live their life. And it's a whole, and if you look at people in that sort of way, and I think we, we sort of understand this without expressing it or thinking it through. And that's why I was like sort of trying to sort of break it down. But when you make choices as to who you want to have around you, who it is that you like, who it is that you like, who it is that you dislike, it tends to be that this is all ultimately that you feel a certain level of concert with that with that you in the other person. Or a certain so, you know, admiration and respect for that 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 part of the the you, which people I think call call soul frequently. But well, I've yeah. I've actually, you know, this is almost the entire topic of prepare the handbook for individual freedom, which is um which is exactly what you're talking about, which is a meditation on individual freedom. And what does that mean? Because um, I fell face the same kind of crisis of thought because I, and it rained mainly because when I, when I really boiled myself, like who is Steve Gosney, right? Mm -hmm. I came down to really two core values. I'd say that, that are expressed that, that I tend to fall that always kind of devolve when I break it down. What is, what is driving me? And number one is truth. And mm -hmm. number two is individual freedom. Right. But I, I kind of, but then, then I, then of course you, you have to place these values, competing values in context and let them fight to say, which one is superior is yeah. it truth or individual freedom. And then, and so I try to imagine that, but to understand that I really had to do an ex, I had to go through a very deep seated exercise in what is, what do I mean by individual freedom? And, uh, and, and you came and you hit it. And I think this goes back to Aristotle, which I discover these minds kind of echo, which is, are you, you are what you habitually do. You are the choices that you make. So your first component there, which is free will is defined by the choices that you are. So if you say you believe in God, you believe in faith, then you choose to be faithful to your wife, to honor God. You choose to speak the truth. You choose to act to not drink to excess. You choose to do whatever the things you choose to do are. And that is that is ultimately who you are. Now, you brought up another point about creativity, which is something I've been thinking a lot of recently because Death Penalty Desires came in, a, basically, I wrote the whole book in 10 days in sort of a flash of inspiration. It's my first novel. And, um, and you know, and... You know, uh, John C. Wright and I had a nice long conversation about the the muse, and I really feel like I, you know, it's inspiration, and it was I was channeling the inspiration, and a lot of musicians will talk about this. You're channeling like the the music exists out here, and your body you channel the expression of the music. And I'm a musician, so I tend to think that way, and that's the way I felt when I was writing it, as I was channeling this idea, the mind, and but I can't really say, you know, was it me? Or was it the muse? I mean, I, I I think it's it's serving the ego to say it was me, and I don't think I think that diminishes the muse. It diminishes the creation to to place on the create the, the artistic creation that is like my book to say, well, that's just me. I wrote everything, which is my ego wants to say that, and that's where I get in trouble. Yeah, I, I wrote it. I, it was all me, and I did it great. But I but to say that it was all me is to deny this inspiration that is the muse that is, I feel outside of me. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you some inspiration to help you with your humility. Okay. Uh, I need to, I, that's I, one of my biggest sins is, is that and I have to constantly I have to be conscious of my own arrogance. And uh, whenever I'm failing, whenever I know that I'm wrong, when I, when I'm certain of something, mm -hmm. that's usually when I'm way off. Well, Talmudic sages going back thousands of years said that in all human traits, balance is the best. You shouldn't be someone who, who is too soft. You shouldn't be someone who's too rigid. You shouldn't, that balance in all these different things, equilibrium, that, that being too parsimonious <laughs> is, is, is wrong. Being over, being overly generous is not, is not healthy either. That there's a certain level of balance that's appropriate. And the one exception, that they say you can never have to excess is humility. That 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 you, that to to channel your own humility and maximize your your own humility, and the more you can maximize it, the 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 better you are as a human. 
that's the only character trait which they say you should that looking towards arrogance is um in any capacity is 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 a terrible is is terrible that leads to terrible downfall for men and i'll tell you i'll tell you this much this is a conversation i had with my son earlier today it was a brilliant young man my son in certain ways smarter than me much smarter so i was having a conversation with him about the um benefits of raising others up and and lowering yourself particularly those in your own environment particularly those who are close to you but it really applies to all people and that is and it's interesting the way i'm going to phrase it's going to sound confusing I, I know this but it's actually the greatest way to raise yourself up is by lowering yourself before others i'm going to say that again the greatest way to raise yourself up is by lowering yourself before others what do, what do i mean by that well first and foremost just uh, i'm going to give you inspiration for your own arrogance is to be more humble which is kind of kind of it sounds it sounds like no i, I get what you're saying you, you finish your thought because i i actually have something to add to this so go ahead so so now so for example we are all judged as being a, a, a as being but based on the, our, our character is often judged based on the company that we keep so the more you can elevate the company that you're keeping so you're only raising yourself up someone will look at you with greater respect if they see that you're sitting with kings and presidents or as today's royalty celebrities that that they they look at you at a, a different level based on that but that's a childish way of looking at the world and that we elevate kings and celebrities the way we do but if you if you surround yourself with people who have good character and you're able to you're able to oh that's that's too close sorry right. sorry I, was just, I just didn't know what that button did i was yeah, now you do now you know don't, don't hit the button don't hit the button don't hit the button yeah um but, but when you're able to to look at others and find the greatness in others and most humans have some some element to them that is going to be superior to you and when you can find that greatness in others and recognize and appreciate them and treat them with respect you end up you end up interacting with them on a whole different level where you, where you actually and and they will draw more respect for you based on that it's a fascinating thing when i first started grow um, my channel growth I, I i fell into this accidentally and it works like this on on so many different levels i'm i would the first when i was on a panel for during the dev v herd trials so at the end, everyone's like pitching, like, you know, why you should follow me, like me, whatever, blah, 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 you know, and this is what I'm covering and, and basically made a pitch, you know, please like, and you know, please, you know, after you're done here, come over my channel and sub up to me. And it was a great way to, to, to basically build subs. And I was like, not in the mood to do that. Like when, like after we've been doing it every day, I was in the mountain, not in the mood to do that. So I basically looked around and I was like, who in this panel here really needs subs badly? And I looked at them and I tried thinking, okay, what do I like about this person's content? And instead of, and when after everyone finished pitching, I was like, you know what? I just want to echo what, what Kurt said or whatever, and just point out to you why it is that you should follow him. And just going on and on for like three minutes about how great Uncivil is, or how great, or how great you know Mike is, or how great Lumber is, or or whatever, or you know. And I basically started doing this thing where i was like i wanted people to appreciate the, the the wonderful content that these guys are pointing out and why you should sub out to them and what i realized is you know if i say this about them it's far it'll ring far more true than if they say it about themselves and it is true and people need to know this so let me just share this with them and i'll get my subs my own but the interesting thing about this is so now what ends up happening from that is here I am on a stream with these people who I'm, I'm expressing my admiration for. And people ended up really liking me more because I wasn't too insecure to basically recognize and validate others around me. So you sort of are, are displaying, and I didn't realize it when I was doing it. Like I was like, I just want to do this. I think it feels like the right thing to do. And, and it ends up raising you up because it's like, wow, you're associated with these people who are doing, you know, who are, high quality high level people and that's why what i'm saying is you should it's especially when it comes to your own family 
that if you raise up your own family and you should do it to them directly and you should do it in public and you raise up people around you, you by association with them automatically get raised up. If you have two slaves and one of them is a slave because he's been taken hostage by some by some lunatic psycho and the other is a slave who was bought by a king, people would look at the slave of a king as someone who, wow, this is a slave who the, you know, the king wants to have this slave. It's by that, through that association, you are automatically raised up. And, and I think people don't appreciate this. And if you do this, it is so, it's such a powerful and toxic that people just, and I'm not telling you to be a false flatterer. That's terrible. That's terrible. That's hypocrisy, whatever. What I'm saying is if you can actually search for the goodness in other people and, genu and give genuine praise to it, that that ultimately people like that and they respect that. The, both the person you're describing and others who hear your description, they it's a very powerful thing where it ends up raising you up in ways that I never even realized until I fell into doing it by accident on, on Alita's depth for your herd stream. And I'm, I'm just going to say this and not to feel intimidated to actually be like, you know what? It's a, it's a reflection of belief in yourself that I don't need to be talking about myself. I don't need people to think that I'm better than this other person. And it's such a wonderful thing to like actually be able to like just give a genuine praise to others, find the good in others. It's such an empowering thing for you to do where you end up becoming like a much greater star than you could possibly make yourself by touting yourself. Um, well, I just let's say uh, I, there's two, two, some super chats, and then I, I want to reflect on what you just said. So thank you for that. Yeah. A great Joe rant. I got an official Joe rant on my. That screen. wasn't a rant. It was. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> but okay. Uh, uh, so Adrian said, "Joe, Lady Logic is right." Creativity and art can be very much you. When I draw my drew my squirrel icon, part of my soul in that every piece I create. Yeah, everything I do, and people always say you're always referring to your books because I pour my heart and soul into this. Yeah. If I'm speaking what I'm thinking. I'm you know there's I, I've worked my whole life to allow the the thoughts and the the channel that muse into some creative outlet that I can express those those ideas in books. And so that's in writing. So I'm communicating through these through these works. And so when I'm referring to it, it's because it's part of me. I'm I'm this is part of what I, you know, this is all coming from all this stuff in my head. And so it's like, well, like I said in prepare, because I've I've worked it to the best of my ability there. And now I'm just trying to verbally summarize what I've said very extensively in it in a writing. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. And then we have another one, Wesley. Um, humidity, I think he means humility. <laughs> is, it works with humidity also. <laughs> <laughs> is, seeing, is seeing the reality of yourself. It is the reason we should humble before God because he is reality. Okay. And this, this segue is very well. Thank you for your rant or your chat. Um, because what you were saying just now is exactly what I try to do in, in everything that I do. When I'm at work, I try to recognize that bit of truth, that bit of God that's beautiful within the person I'm interacting with. And now, some people, it's a lot more challenging than others, right? But people are starved for praise. There's so much criticism. There's so much negativity. And negativity is so much more powerful than the positives. And yeah. yet, so, so don't, like you said, don't lie. But look for that expression of goodness and truth and godliness in the other person and recognize it by praising it, by noting it. Do that. Mm -hmm. Just just start doing that in your day. Find somebody who needs some good words. Find something about them that is within their control, not like you have a pretty hat, but something yeah. like, you know, I love the way that you really work hard or you you really dedicate yourself or you, you try to strive to that. Something about them individually, the characteristic that is worthy of praise and point that out to them and reflect it back at them. Yeah. Now, also, um, another reflection is that um, you were talking about humbling yourself, and this goes into the humbling idea. When we humble ourselves, we humble, you have to, and this is what goes back to faith, humble yourself before the correct idol, yeah. before the correct, because it would be easy to serve a false god. And, you know, and people, we start talking God, you're like, oh, and you're talking about the big spaghetti monster in the sky again, you're a crazy, you know, Christian 
Jew, whatever. Anyone who's tuning into religion, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, they're fine with God. You don't have to. Yeah, don't well, have to I get you, but let's just. Uh, but <laughs> the thing is, is that it's not because God is the only vessel worthy of your praise and submission. Are you going to submit yourself to, to a drug? You are diminishing yourself by the submission to a drug. Are you going to sub, yeah. are you going to diminish yourself in the face of sex or in the face of rock and roll, even though right. it's pretty cool? Right. You know, the fact is, it's not worthy of your submission. But what what, what things that are worthy are God like things, the moral, the fountain of morality, the fountain of truth and goodness. That is where you should serve. That is the God that you should. So God is the alt, the pinnacle of your ethical pyramid. Yeah, and and serving the correct one, choosing that correct path for which to submit yourself makes you greater. It it elevates you. You submit your you submit your individual to um to something greater than yourself, and you lift yourself up. I mean, I think it, and there's in upon the horizons in the chat. He'll he'll give me the biblical quotation, but it's, you know, Christ says my burden, you know, I want everything that you are, but my burden is light. Meaning that I want your total commitment. But if you follow that path, your life will be better and will be happier and easier. It's it's not a hard path. It sounds like a lot because to the ego, it's a threat. What do you mean? Give up everything. You mean give up me because I'm so important. Now I'm worshiping myself but I'm not worthy of worship. Only God is. So give God everything, but that burden is light and it will make your, your stride much easier. One more. Uh, there, one there's, I'll let you there, reflect. Yeah, there, one second. My therapist will be glad I caught your stream before God. <laughs> there you go. There you go. What do you that, think? There's a, there's a similar passage in Torah where, where Moses says something which is just baffling, which is like, what more is God asking you that other than you follow all the Torah and the commandments? Like right. that's that's in, like one of the last things he says before he dies. Yeah, it's like, thing. and you're like, what, <laughs> what? But if you actually look at it as this is designed to help you live a healthier life, in that case, it's not asking you. It's basically saying, just look after yourself, and here's like your guidebook as to how you can lead a healthier, happier life. Then it's not really asking a lot of, of you. So in that sense. And in, in, in that sense, if you look at it in that sense, it, it, it makes it's it's a lot easier to comprehend, I guess. You know, when you were talking about rock and roll, because we, we we didn't really let's, get let's on go. That. Yeah, let's move to rock and roll. So shift the conversation. We got I our. Think, final I think I think this plays into what you were what you were saying that if you're doing something all the time, it starts becoming you, and and I agree with that completely. In fact, um, when I was in first year uh, uh, undergrad. Um, and I was studying yeshiva at that point. I made a friend um, back then who basically became a lifelong friend named Dave. And he was telling me how he was talking to his rabbi, who, and he was like, I feel as if I, there's, a, there's a person that I present to the world, and then there's me. And those are two different things. And I'm wondering, which one is me? And, and he said, if that's what you're presenting to the world every day, that is you. You might think of yourself as being better than that, right? Or whatever above that, but that is you. Yeah, that is you, right? And and to me, the, the the problem with rock and roll is is primarily if you just sort of make it a major major portion of who you are. The messaging in rock and roll is really self destructive. Much of it, much of it, some, is very some. Is some. Very, Let's not say much. Some, a significant portion. Well, if you're into lyrics, I, right. I don't, I, you know, I, I very rarely listen to lyrics. There's very few lyricists that I actually pay attention to. The, the exceptions to that would be the police and ginger <laughs> who I think are wonderful poets. And I actually do enjoy their, but there's a most music. I don't listen to the lyrics and, mm -hmm. and I, and you know, what I was talking about, I talk about this and prepare again about the levels of reality. So we're separated from God by, multiple multiple levels at least six or seven levels and in music to me there's something transcendent about music and it, it it's like 100 percent. and look it I'm, can take you a step closer to god definitely and it's, so it's like maybe you know maybe you're just moving one level up the rung of ladder towards closer but but you are transcending the the average experience of humanity through, through music oh um, look i'll tell you this you know well i i've I've enjoyed rock for 
you know, since I'm, since I'm a kid. Okay. So I'm not telling you that I've, I've never, I've never listened to rock music or whatever, quite the contrary. I mean, I, I don't, I don't listen nearly as much today or in the last like several years as I did in my youth. Much of the messaging there is primarily about drugs, sex, or basically, you know, living or love. It's sex, drugs, love, or basically finding ways to self-soothe. And that's not that's not there's, there's not too many rock songs about about building up your own character. Some of them are religious and will be about like you know you know you have your religious gospel rock type of thing, which I can understand how 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 um, that can certainly be rewarding for you know, for Christians. I can definitely understand that. I can definitely understand that. And there's similar things we have in Jewish music, which I can understand. I can understand that also. I'm. I'm simply saying much of what we describe as being, you know, your typical rock. Tell me, have you ever, can you name, how many rock songs can you name that, that are not within those three topics of sex, drugs, love? Well, it's hard. You, well, it's hard. I have, how long do you have? No, I could go on and on. <laughs> you don't understand. I mean, I have thousands and thousands of CDs my whole life. I mean, to me, music is such a huge part of my life. I, I could talk nothing but music for days. Um, so I could come or having fun in one form or another. But I, I recognize now. So, but now we're getting into the messaging question. So let's, I, you know, and I had this. Do you want to talk I, about just the beats themselves as to whether or not there's something wrong with rock and roll? Well, let, let I have a, I have a friend who's very fundamentalist Christian okay. and he only listens to praise music, only listens to music that explicitly references his faith and mm -hmm. God. And so that he, when he listens to music, he wants to have his faith reflected in that music. Now, to me, and, and we've had a big discussion on this, and my son my son is very opinionated, and he's like, no, um, he's like, Christian music is crap. <laughs> 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 and of course, and that, that sparked quite a discussion between him and his godfather. That's his godfather, who's a cool guy. I actually had a stream with him. You guys can go back and reference it. And they had a big discussion about that. And I actually kind of agree with my son, because to me, if you're saying Christian music, you're taking away from the music. Now you're putting something up there. It's like, it's like, uh, what is it? Social justice. It's the opposite of justice, right? Because why do you have to modify justice? Because it means something else, right? So to mm -hmm. me, music is transcendent as a thing. Now, there is a question about messaging, which you're bringing up. So I have sort of like, there's there's definitely music that, that means something to me lyrically, that speaks to me, and I like the lyrics, and I, I find the artistry of it rewarding lyrically. But then most music, I just listen to it artistically as a sound, sonic thing that transcends. I appreciate the musicianship. I appreciate the craftsmanship, the beauty of the music. It's looking, and it's like when Catholic Church goes into a, a secular society and, and converts the, the music. They don't throw out every tradition. If something's beautiful, they incorporate it because beauty is an expression of God. And right. so unless it explicitly conflicts with the faith, they retain it. Now, right. that goes back to now, what about those artists that explicitly contradict your faith and are against you? And 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 in that case, I will say there are a couple bands. It was very hard for me to continue, even though I appreciate the musicianship and the beauty of the music. There's some bands that I have a real problem supporting. And I'll give you number one example is Roger Waters, who Roger Waters, I loved his Pink Floyd stuff, but to me, his his anti-Semitism is so over the line and so full of hatred that I will not go see, I will not, I will, I am consciously opposed to giving him one of my pennies to support anything that he does at this point because. I know I still listen to the old Pink Floyd, but it's not to me. It's like he's gone such a, such a hate room, and I wouldn't go. I wouldn't go listen to some skinhead group either, or white supremacist group, or black supremacist group for that matter. Or a, so mm -hmm. you know, there are, there are groups that are groups are like Satanist kind of death metal type things. Mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't like that stuff, and I consciously avoid it. But if it's not explicitly anti Christian, if it's kind of in the neutral category or it's artistic expression, then I'm perfectly fine with it. But that's actually, you see, that's now not rock and roll. That's a cult. That's an objection to absorbing culture from someone who you find objectionable. The same way, I can't watch, I can't watch Robert De Niro anymore because of his crazy Trump 
like derangement where he's basically right. I mean, he's just like a, he sounds like a lunatic so when i see him you know when i when i see him that's all i can think about it's like i can't think about him as being a mobster i think of him or you know someone in mafia i i just i just think psychopath so um but and, so that's not really a question about rock and roll per se, the way people say sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's, that's what I'm saying. Like when you talk about rock and roll in the context of sex and drugs, I think it has to be about the messaging, right? Well, no, but but see, I think music transcends the message. The, the lyrics, you know, it is a is a musical note a particular does that have any statement of morality? I mean, to me, right. music music is great because it's beautiful. And and I think beauty is is an expression. It's a way for us to get in closer to God. You know, you decorate those those notes with lyrics, and only those lyrics that explicitly contradict my faith. Or uh, will I? You know, if I won't, I try not to buy into groups that are. I mean, but you know, I but the music to me, if the music is beautiful, the music's beautiful. Unless they explicitly say, "I hate you," I want nothing. Then I'll listen to them. But. Um, I don't know. This is my opinion, and it, it may be, you know, in the classical music is a good example. I'm Chrissy upon the horizons, reminding me that all classical music is founded in the Catholic Church, and I appreciate that. But um, and I love classical well, so music. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want to just follow up that question for you on that, though. So you think, like, let's say the intro to Ozzy Osbourne "Thunder," right? Right. The the, the, the iconic, you know, the or the intro to "Sweet Child of Mine." Okay. Do, 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 do. Oh, that's so annoying. That's not beautiful. That's annoying. Do, 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 do. Oh God. I heard that so much when I was growing up. That, yeah. that is just an annoying guitar line. Yeah, I also worked at a guitar store, you understand? So yeah. people would like come on and all the kids would like play that's, that. That's song the first thing that they're gonna play, right? That's the first thing they're gonna play, right? <laughs> so yeah, but it's you think that you think that there's something like I don't I, you think there's something like um, there's there's some message in that, or some sort of tone, it's, or that it's, it's beauty. It's like a, it's a work of art. It's it's. An I agree with you. Painting. I agree it, with you. It, it, it allows us to transcend the average mundane every day and get one step closer to God. And and I and I I find that music does that. It takes me away, takes me out of the ordinary. But in that sense, rock and roll is no different from cl from classical music, yes. from 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 anything. I don't make. I don't make. That, that, I like jazz. Mozart. I like classical it's blues. Mozart wrote, right? Yes, I like it all. Okay, so so in that so so in that sense, I don't think that when people say sex, drugs, and rock and roll, they're talking about music. I think they're specifically talking about rock and roll. That well, but I'm, but I'm kind of the reason I rock and roll. It's a Jew and Catholic discuss, and so one of the points that I want to make is that <laughs> you didn't want forget the rock and roll part of it. We well, just... No, no, but no, I, I want to talk <laughs> rock and roll because I want people to understand that because we have faith doesn't mean we reject sex, drugs, or rock and roll. I mean, that we have uh, okay, I see. We have saying. a you know, it's like what is the perspective? Oh, you guys just don't have any fun. You sit around praying all day and you know, saying staying in. No, I mean. There's sex is allowed in our lives. We sex enriches our lives. Sex is an important part of life. Music in poor is an important part of life. You know, we drink wine not to excess, but it's not like it's forbidden. And you know, there's it's you know we don't want to punish ourselves. We don't do things to excess. We are against you know certain drugs and, and a lot of most drugs. I mean, you know, abusing yourself, destroying your mind because the God has built you a temple. And you need to be careful with what you consume and, and abuse yourself with because this is all your consciousness and your freedom of choice is all you have, right? Your consciousness and your ability to choose. And when you affect that with intoxicants through the ability you can't choose, you're destroying that which makes you important to the world and to God. Um, so, but I just kind of, the reason I wanted to have this stream with you is because I, I wanted to knock down this lie. There you go. Somehow when you're a religious person, that you can't enjoy things. Amen. Amen. I, to I totally agree with you on that. Totally agree with you on that. If anything, I think you actually find ways to have deeper enjoyment, ultimately. Well, see, that's a perfect note. To, you know, it's, we've been going two hours, man. Yeah. And I love it. I can I can talk with you all day and all night, but I, I respect your time. I appreciate that. I know, I'm I would, I would what I want to I'm supposed huh? to start my stream in 10 minutes, so I would stay longer, but I need to sort of... Can I can I redirect to your screen? I would I would love it if you did that.
Okay, I'll do that. But uh, let me leave it with this because we were let's let's do what we uh, let's uh, what do you call it? Um, do as we say. I'm going to praise you, and then you're going to praise me. How's that? All right, a let's mutual praise society. Let me let me get let me get your redirect up. Well, I'll praise you first, and then I'll, I'll work on my redirect as you. Uh, I will yeah. say Joe of Good Logic. I'd say my favorite guy to to stream with. Wow, and, you know, and I, that's. I've worked, I've worked on this a lot and I've dealt with a lot of people and there's a lot of people that have different agendas and stuff, but I, I just find a, a commonality, a brother, a man who is honest, thoughtful, humble, and always worth listening to. And I'm, every moment that I have with, to talk with Joe of Good Logic is, is a moment of, um, of transcendent truth. And I, I really am pleased that you have taken your time to, to to be with me and to talk with me and to share your time with me because i know time is precious so it's, it's people... really my privilege and what's amazing about 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 steve over here is that he puts up with my ramblings and <laughs> that makes him it displays patience <laughs> and, and patience kindness and patience yeah the <laughs> <laughs> patience and kindness no and then the thing that I, I one of the things you're the only person that i can have these conversations with like these are conversations that i will have i'll have sometimes individually on a stream i'll just sort of like you know have a thought and i'll just sort of ramble off into the sunset and i'll talk about it for like five minutes and maybe interact with a couple of, uh, you know a couple people on stream who have thoughts that i think um you know i, sh I should i should address but uh, yeah, you're the only person who I get to like sort of bounce these ideas off of. And that is a reflection of someone who's actually looking to grow. Like you actually like you're just genuinely searching for truth. Absolutely. Always. Yeah. Always. And that's and that's and that's and and always with integrity and, and insight. And you're you're just you're you're a treasure. You're you're the treasure of, of the internet. So I, I thank you for for inviting me. I feel badly that I too that I, I end up like pushing you to the side sometimes is really because I'm always afraid of how, about scheduling something and then I'm going to like, and the timing and, and when news breaks on this issue or that issue and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this or like whatever. And I'm also terrified I'm going to forget. Like I'm always afraid. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to forget. And then people are going to be like, where the hell were you? So that's the, but I, I hope to have many, many, many more of these conversations with you because well, next I, we'll do I it over your channel next. And I, I'm, you know, and everybody tells me about pushing books and stuff, but I, I really, I want to, I want people to read what I've written. It's not, it's, I, I do it and I, you know, I have to break even and all that. But the reason I write it is because I have something to say and I want, I want to share that with the world and, and I want people to read and have their life enriched. And that's one of the things, I mean, you enrich my life. So if people would sign up, I mean, I, my little tiny little stream over here in the corner of the internet, which is rambling on a million different topics, whatever hits my mind, whatever the muse says, but here's Joe, he's the man. You are much more professional than I, you cover law stuff and you're very thoughtful on it. So Joe of good logic, and he's got to go. And what I'm going to do is we're going to talk a little. I'm going to let Joe go. We'll talk for another seven minutes. And then when I <laughs> shut down, Joe will be on and he'll redirect and you'll immediately pipeline and do a Gosney raid right over into Joe of Good Logic. So Beautiful. if you aren't signed up to Joe of Good Logic, this is the this is the man that you need to be because he has cool people on like like uh, Ron Coleman and great logic. His dad is also a joy to, to listen to. This is where he gets it, you know. That's true. That's true. Thank you so much, my brother. It's awesome as always. See you later, I mean, man. I mean, my friend, thank you again. God bless you. All right. That was great, man. It's Joe awesome or what? He is great, great, great. I, I just, I've been looking forward to this stream for like all week, actually, because I knew, I knew it would be fun. It always is. I don't even, we don't plan. We just come on and talk and it's always good. You know, what can I say? So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, we got about seven minutes before Joe starts up his stream. So yeah, his local stream is great too. Um, reason for writing is yeah, I, you know why do I write? I don't know. It's the creative muse. I I want to get stuff out. There's stuff that I I don't know. Why not? What else? What are you doing with your life? Right? <laughs> it's like I, I it's a hobby and it's it's an expression. It's you have to honor the muse. You have to do it. Um, so I don't know. It's what it is. 
So it's been great. And, and you chatters are wonderful. Thank you for showing up. So it's complicated. All of my stuff at stevegosney.com, all of these books, one, two, three, four, five, six books now currently there. Um, yeah, high five. <laughs> Um, the newest one that just got released is Death Penalty Desires, Passion, Lust, and Murder, a novel involving crime. And uh, it's a crime with a love story. It's sort of if you like crime novels and mysteries and romance, it's written really for the ladies, but it's really anybody who's interested in those topics. Uh, if you want the PG version, that's available at Amazon.com. And you have to search for it. I'm not, I don't pay to promote anything. I don't massage the algorithm. I don't beg for YouTube memberships. I don't do any of the stuff I should be doing. I do it. I want you to do it. I want you to choose to get these because you're interested in it will enrich your life. Um, but if you are easily offended or you're a very committed Christian and you feel that that sexual topics are off limits then get the PG version, which is, you'll see it has a blue and it's death penalty desired with a D, passion and murder, lust has been removed. It shortens the book a little bit, not too much. Um, it takes it takes away a little bit of this. It takes just away the, the um, some of the stuff. Instead of the, this book, death penalty desires is about the sex toy killer. Death penalty desired with a D is about the jealousy killer, you see? So I, I modify, take out the sex toy thing, see? So um, there's a dominance and submission theme in Death Penalty Desires. Um, I take out that of the uh, of the PG rated, and mainly because this book will work with Death Penalty Debates. In fact, the order, you should, if you're interested in Death Penalty stuff, read Death Penalty Desires first, or the novel first, that gives you a framework for a criminal death penalty trial from investigation or crime investigation trial sentencing the whole arc of one that's what the book is and then you read death penalty debates so that you'll understand you'll have a context and a framework for understanding what that is and this is the public policy debate and now i'm also working on my next book which is death penalty designs which is to give you the legal framework for how the death penalty is actually implemented in law it will be Kind of a combination of ideas and answers in law a much more hard law academic book so that one's going on so um is there there's not a crime solving dog that's a good question though um i i don't know i haven't until i've got like i said the pg version of this book is on amazon exclusively the r version is on steve gosney exclusively so that, that will determine where you go. Now, why did I say that? Um, oh, and so I haven't done a formal, like, what do you call it? Introductory stream? Is that what you call it? Like a, um, I haven't done a formal book launch because I want to kind of get all of the stuff geared up before I, I do my, you know, I want to make sure everything's available. Right now, it's all pre-orders. All, although the eBooks. I, let me take that back. The ebooks are available right now. You can get the R-rated version of the ebook right now from from uh, stevegosney.com. You get the PG version right now on Kindle. In fact, that version I think is available for free if you have Kindle Unlimited. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, actually, yes. See, this is this all started with you, chat guys over here. You chat guys, you think you have an impact. This is a dialogue. We're seeking things together, and the legal vices chat inspired this book because they were they were they're trying to like I, it was a funny it's, I, I was relaxed after getting a death penalty case appeal filed and i relaxed the next day i was like filed i'm done with that and i can just relax and when i relaxed the muse hit me and somebody was joking in the chat um yeah make a make a make a stream of, or make a, a book about death penalty desires about the heroic appellate lawyer and, and that's what got my thinking going. And it just exploded. It's like, yeah, that's a great idea. And I was laughing. I was relaxed. And I was at a peak. And I just wrote it. So that's it just kind of came out of nowhere. It's the honor of the muse, right? That's that's the thing. Um, you didn't derail me. Why do you say you derailed me? You're, you're all good. Um, 
everything everybody else goes so that's it. oh and i've got oh two more things i've got a meet and greet in orlando this saturday so that's two days from now tomorrow's friday and then saturday i have a meet and greet it's actually a vendor display at the mary i think it's the marriott downtown in orlando from like 10 to 3. so i'll be at a booth selling my books i'll sign if you if you're in orlando area and you want to come by on saturday it's you can go to go to my web page i'll show you how to find these events right now go over here and uh, that's the first one so if you go to my web page right you see that and then go up here to events so there's a meet and greet orlando march 16th that's the orlando vendor fair march 16th from 10 to 3 at the down marriott downtown orlando on livingston and then on march 30th i'll be in savannah and that's a meet and greet at 8 p.m in savannah georgia at the bow bow lounge the bow bob lounge and that's the jw marriott savannah plant river district very nice bar there's the bar right there there's the the hotel so i will be um so i'm going to be doing two meet and greets one's in orlando this saturday and then the next one is going to be in savannah so if you can come by that would be cool man if you guys can go you, you, can you come by and say hello to the old guys man um, the first the, the meet and greet is in or in Savannah is the one that we could sit down and have a drink at the bar. The one at, at the vendor shop will be more of like a, a vendor table where we'll be I'll be pitching books and selling stuff. So so trying to figure out how to get the whole marketing and tamped down on the books. I, I'm not very good at that. I, I'm good at writing them, I guess, but marketing them, I'm still working at. Like I said, I need to come up with a, a big Vices did it last time, but I hate to call on Vices again because he's so generous with his time. And um, he's already done more than I can expect. So I don't want to just say, hey, Legal Vices, will you pitch my opening book again? I don't want to do that for, with um, with Mr. Legal Vices. Um, will I record what? What does, what does that mean? Yeah, just sort of look this <laughs> I don't know. We're here. We're here. Just hang out for a little bit else. What else we got? Um, I was playing the guitar. Isn't that a pretty bass? So the books I'm, I'm currently, I, I, I've been, part of it is right now I'm, I'm going to be doing arguing before the Florida Supreme court sometime in the next couple months on my, one of my death penalty. Actually, there's two death penalty cases. that will be coming up middle or end of the year before the Florida Supreme court. And um, so those are in the pipeline. So right now I am preparing for that, preparing for that by writing my next book, which is Death Penalty Des Designs, which will be a legal, a, a compendium of legal challenges to Florida's death penalty statute. And as I work on that book, that makes me better and more able to argue the points in um, before the Florida Supreme Court. So you'll be able to see me argue it and, uh, and, uh, and then maybe the book will be available in the next few months that one so you got to catch up if you if you don't have these books you need to catch up right uh your meet and greetings um let's see what, what's happening will i record what your meet and greet oh no no recording it's just you and me we just sit down i i, I love the meet and greets because usually you know i don't have like tons of people showing up i might have you know, two or three or five people. I think I had six people show up in, where was that? I can't remember. I just remembered the hotel lobby. People show up and it was fun, man. We just have, we get, we go and go and go. And we talk. Like when we went in Las Vegas with Nick Riqueda and I and uh, Branca, man, we talked for, we talked like till 6 a.m. in the morning. It was awesome. It was awesome. And uh, so I just like talking to folks. You know me, I like talking, right? Um, making it, no, I, I don't want to, I want truth in advertising. Uh, these these are crazy. So have you all got, Death Penalty Desires is, I'm getting the proof copies in. I'm As soon as I get all the books, like I'm going to have the softbacks, the hardbacks, all the production lines set up. Once all that's done, then I'm going to figure out where we can do like a big splashy, uh, maybe I'll just do it on my stream. Who knows? And I'll just invite a bunch of guests. What do you think about that? Uh, 
That would be cool. Well, Joe's late to his stream. What's he been doing, man? I'm waiting. Are you guys, are you guys watching uh, Joe? I've been. A, where is he? I'm waiting for Joe so that you can all go. Joe Ray, Gosney Raid. People are falling off. Uh, yeah. What else is happening? So I've got meet and greets. I've got death. Oh, and then the fantasy novel has gotten. Let me see what I got here. These are. Um, yeah, the fantasy novel kind of got sidelined, but it's good that I wrote this first because this has a mystery element in it. And my third book of the fantasy th trilogy is had a whodunit mystery kind of thing. So working through that and, and constructing that in Death Penalty Desires is pretty cool. Um, yeah, so here's the... I actually have been saving these transcripts because some people like Danielle and uh, Flux wanted the uh you know the transcripts let's see what else i have here got a ideas and answers you can still get a hard cover of ideas and answers hard cover oh man what else i'm not gonna i don't think i'm gonna have a stream now for the until sometime next week i've got so much um so much going on and i'm sort of tired uh, guys have any good ideas? All right. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to send you over. So go ahead and do a Gazi raid. You know, Joe, I don't know what he's doing. I think we'll just shut it down there. I don't, I don't have anything more to say right now. And thank you all for showing up and thank you for the rewatch crew too. God bless you guys. Um, no, oh, this one here desires. It's the same cover. The only difference, the PG version has blue and it's desired and it's passion and murder. The R-rated version is desires with an S, and it's pink, and it's passion, lust, and murder. So good question. All right. Thank you, guys. Go say Gosney Raid, even though Joe's not there. <laughs>